G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So, before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. Now, CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favourite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there, and I hope you guys check it out because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. We've just discovered the most bizarre virus by Mr. Outlaw. Alright, long story short, uh, my name is Cam and I'm a virologist. If, If you've never heard of that title, it's just a person who studies or researches viruses and any biological agents resembling them. It's, it's a decent job, pays well and keeps me interested. And I've never really thought about pursuing anything else. That was. Until last night. We've discovered something very bad. I was a part of a five-person team in a small lab situated up in the mountains of a Western European country. I'm not going to give uh, too many specifics here. The project was spearheaded by a particularly exceptional microbiologist. Let's call him Hathaway. Now, Hathaway had been on vacation for a while in South America. Everybody who worked closely with him or knew him well thought that this was incredibly strange. I mean, the guy, he never took a break. However, it all made sense when he came back. He... He looked like absolute shit. There were very heavy bags under his eyes and scratches all over his face. He was jittery as all hell and could barely string together a coherent sentence. As we would learn later, he was never actually on vacation. I guess you could say that it was more like a business trip of sorts. Apparently... He'd been in contact with a colleague of his based in Chile. He'd been informing Hathaway about some peculiar events occurring in a small village near the coast. Something to do with a a potential unknown disease? The specifics remained a mystery to us at the time. All Hathaway said was that it was worth looking into. What worried a lot of us, though, were the cuts on his face and forearms. When asked about it... He simply claimed that he'd fallen down a few times while hiking. Without knowing what else to believe, we we just bought it. Besides, the prospect of studying a new virus was incredibly intriguing. This might have been something big. We got to work right away. As the five of us, me, Hathaway, Jake, Beth and Colin, congregated in the main lab... Hathaway carried in what appeared to be a fortified glass tank containing a single bird. I think it was an Andean condor, a native to Chile. I'll be honest, I was a bit worried at that point. We didn't even bother asking how he got it past the border security. Uh, tell me this isn't some derivative of the bird flu? Jake asked. No, Hathaway responded. I, uh, I I have no idea what it is, actually. We all collectively raised our eyebrows at this. You see, it's definitely not airborne. You can also touch the bird as much as you like, and nothing will happen to you. It's, It's transmitted some other way. That's when I noticed that the bird was actually blindfolded. I don't know why I hadn't earlier, why nobody had even pointed it out. I guess my subconscious wasn't expecting such a bizarre sight. Don't tell me it has something to do with that, I asked, pointing to where its eye should have been. 
Everybody else seemed to catch on to the strange detail, too. Hathaway stayed quiet for a second, staring at the ground before finally nodding. Are you kidding me? Jake inquired. How does that work? Wait, what the hell's even wrong with the bird? I found myself blurting out, although it was a fair question. Upon initial glance at it, nothing at all seemed to be off. But the only somewhat strange thing was that it, it hadn't moved much. Hathaway sighed. Not at first, right? He dug around in his bag and pulled out another smaller tank. It was filled with beetles. We'll do a demonstration here. He walked over to the bird tank and dumped all of the beetles in. Holy shit. I heard somebody mutter from behind me. Once Hathaway was finished, he turned back to us. His expression at the time was dead serious. In the gravest tone that I had ever heard come from him, he spoke to us. Okay, so listen. I'm about to take the blindfold off of this bird. Whatever you do, don't look at it. In fact, just leave the room. I'll tell you when you can come back. I think that we all hesitated for just a second when he said that. What the hell was going on? Eventually, we all just did as we were told. We stood out in the hall in absolute silence for... And maybe about three minutes. At the time, I, I couldn't understand why it took so long for him to take a damn blindfold off. But then, the noises started. I, I can't even find a way to describe them. They, they couldn't have come from a bird, that's for sure. Or, or at least, they shouldn't have. If anything, it was like a screech, except extremely deep and guttural, and also somehow discompobulated. A few seconds later, we heard Hathaway screaming expletives. It sounded like he was in pain. We stood there frozen, not knowing at all what to do. Eventually, we were called back in. Hesitantly, I went first. As soon as I stepped in there, I saw Hathaway disinfecting his hand, which was now cut open. As we started wrapping it up, I turned my attention to the bird. It looked the same way as it was before. The only difference was that it was covered in beetle guts. And so were the glass walls of the tank. After we'd all settled down from the initial shock, Hathaway uh, tried to explain what the hell had just happened. So, here's what I think. Uh, somehow, uh, this virus is transferred upon direct eye contact with an infected specimen. What the fuck? Jake interjected. No, no, fuck that. It, it makes absolutely no sense. You think I don't know that? Hathaway interrupted back. Just, just listen, all right? Anyways, there aren't any immediate indication when something's been infected. They'll act exactly the same as they were before. At least, at first, that is. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when they start changing. I'd say maybe three hours, tops. But once they do... You notice. The best thing to do is to blindfold them. That way, you can't get infected, and the subject loses all of its symptoms. Well, I suppose that the best thing to do is to actually blindfold them, but I had to demonstrate first. Now, we just have to figure out what the hell is actually going on. After the brief and, albeit, somewhat unsatisfying explanation, we... we went to work. But shit only kept getting stranger. 
after we'd blindfolded and killed the bird, Hathaway instructed us to start dissecting the brain. At first, we were tentative. After witnessing what had just happened, we were scared as hell of contracting whatever the hell it was that the bird had. Besides, we weren't even trained surgeons. However, Hathaway insisted that the only way this virus could be transmitted was by eye contact. As strange as this all was, we just went along with it. His reasoning for dissecting the brain first was that he'd made the assumption that this virus must be affecting the host on a mainly psychological basis. And as it turns out, he was right. Once the brain was exposed, we noticed something truly inexplicable. Something was moving around in there. We all turned to Hathaway, hoping for further explanation. It's a parasite? Beth asked, looking mortified. Hathaway shook his head, looking incredibly confused. No, no, it shouldn't be. The bird's been alive for weeks after infection. I don't see any signs of physical deterioration. No nutrient deficiencies. None of that. We were all absolutely baffled at this point. What kind of fucking virus is large enough to be visible? We just started at it, not knowing what to do. Then, out of nowhere, the brain started bulging outward. Hathaway's face dropped. It must know that the host is dead. It's trying to come out. Thinking quickly, I went and grabbed a nearby breaker. I managed to trap the thing just as it burrowed its way out. I really didn't know what the hell to expect at this point, but it didn't stop me from being completely surprised at the appearance of this thing. It looked absolutely alien. It nearly resembled a bacteriophage, except for the fact that it seemed to have tiny suction caps covering it. The head also appeared to be partially mechanical almost, with tubes protruding out and connecting to the legs. It was about the size of a black widow spider. I heard a cacophony of screams ring throughout the room, while Hathaway shouted at me to not let it out. As everything started to settle down, we managed to transport it into another glass tank, this time smaller and more fortified. We spent the next 12 hours observing and analysing it. The conclusion that we came to? It made no fucking sense. We couldn't classify it, nor make sense of its various parts. Hell, the thing was too fucking huge to be any kind of pathogen. We would have written it off as some kind of undiscovered jungle creature. But the fact remained that it seemed to affect the behaviours of its host organisms. Eventually, we just decided to secure it and leave it, planning to continue our research the next day, even though that was unlikely to yield any solid results. Most of us even considered just turning it over to the government, we, sure as hell, didn't know what to do with it at the time. However, Hathaway, he declined that proposition. We'll figure out what it is, okay? He claimed, sounding somewhat unconfident. This is big, alright? I'm not letting it go just yet, okay? Tired as hell and not wanting to get into an argument... We all decided to head off to our separate temporary dorms in order to get some rest. What a big fucking mistake that was. We... We should have burned that thing right then and there. I remember lying in bed that night when a troubling thought creeped into my head. If... The way that this virus was transmitted was by making eye contact with an infected organism. Then, wouldn't looking directly at the virus itself cause something similar to happen? 
How the hell would that even work, though? Did it replicate through our thoughts? Or did it need to control optical nerves in order to spread? How could that even make sense? But then again, none of this really did. However, I did recall Hathaway claiming that symptoms would surface three hours tops after the initial infection. And it had been a hell of a lot longer than that. Being somewhat reassured, I just passed out. G'day mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the second half of the story to thank all of you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. And if you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favour to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's b-i-s-h dot b-u-s-t-a at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and without further ado, here's the rest of the story. I woke up about four hours later. I groggily rubbed my eyes, wondering what could have taken me out of my slumber. I'm usually a very deep sleeper. As I awoke back into reality, I... I heard it. Somebody was mumbling down the hall. It sounded like Jake. I got up and opened my door, planning to confront him. I stepped out and saw a silhouette, shrouded in darkness about 20 meters away. His back was turned to me, so I prepared to call out. And that's when I felt somebody cover my mouth and pull me into an adjacent hallway. Uh, reeling at the initial shock, I looked behind me and realized that it was Hathaway. I was about to shout at him once he let me go, but he motioned for me to be quiet. I also saw the desperation in his eyes, so I stayed silent as he gestured me back towards the lab. I realized that we were fucked as soon as I saw what had happened. The reinforced glass tank where we had been holding the virus, it was empty. Whatever this thing was, it was out. Do not look in his eyes, okay? Hathaway told me, in reference to Jake. We... We weren't careful enough. It must have infected him. Did... Did he open the tank? I asked him. He shook his head. No, no way. You need a password for it. It's not even written down anywhere. Only I know it. I looked back at the tank in abject confusion. There weren't any cracks on it or anything. There was no feasible way out. Then, how the hell did... I began to ask him, but he cut me off. Look, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a lot more about this thing that we can't understand. He sighed throwing his hands behind his head. My mind started racing. If this virus, or whatever it was, could have escaped at any time, then why didn't it make a move earlier? This... this thing must have been smarter than we'd anticipated. I guess it somehow knew that it had a better chance of escaping when nobody was monitoring it. But how did it escape? My thoughts were interrupted when we heard a knocking coming from outside the lab door. Uh, hello? A voice called out. It was Colin. I got up to open the door, but Hathaway pulled me back down. What the hell, man? I barked at him. Let him in before he sees Jake. No, what if he already has? Hathaway responded. Then, I thought about it. 
it takes around three hours for the symptoms to manifest. So, even if he's been infected, he wouldn't know it yet. Uh, what the hell are you guys doing in there? I can hear you. Let me in. Jake's been really fucking weird. It's actually kind of scary. Weird how? Hathaway asked. Well, he woke me up when he walked past my door. Actually, I think he was standing right outside for some time. Yeah, he was mumbling something. I opened the door and asked him what the hell he was doing. It was dark, but I could tell that he was just staring at me. And then he just started rambling. It was just nonsense. He was stringing words together, but none of it made any sense. After a while of him not responding to a word I said, I just, I gave up and walked past him. That was like five minutes ago. Look, are you guys going to come out or what? What are we supposed to do? Hathaway and I exchanged worried glances. If Jake really was infected, then so was Colin. We didn't move. Fuck's sake, what are you guys doing? Colin went on, sounding more agitated now. Is there a reason you won't let me in? That was followed by silence. A few seconds later, we heard him mumbling something. Shit. Tell me Jake wasn't infected, right? I guess our silence wasn't enough of an answer. No fucking way. What happens next, Hathaway? What the hell am I supposed to do then? Hathaway just sighed and shook his head. I don't know. I'm sorry. We heard him shout some more expletives before walking away, fuming. We sat there for a while after that, having no idea what to do. Is, is there an emergency escape in here or something? I asked him. No, but it wouldn't matter anyways. We can't let those guys out of here. I've yet to see what effects it has on a human, but it can't be anything good. And don't even ask me about a cure, because I have no idea. So, what are you saying? I asked him, dreading the answer. Best case scenario is that we blindfold and restrain them before they show any signs of aggression. He sighed, looking down at the ground before continuing. And then we hand them over to somebody else. Somebody who can deal with this. Because we sure as hell can't. I know who he meant by that. I guess he just didn't want to admit it. Hathaway pulled out two rolls of duct tape as well as what appeared to be two tranquilizer guns. I didn't bother asking him why he had them. But slowly and quietly, we opened the door and walked out into the hallway. The lights above were dimmed so we could see, but not that well. Honestly... I was terrified at this point. I kept thinking about that damn bird. I didn't see what it actually did, but the results spoke volumes. I did not want to witness how that translated over to humans, that's for sure. We walked down the various corridors for about five minutes before we heard a soft voice to the hallway left of us. It was Jake. This is roughly what he was saying. In time, where in time, I, it doesn't make sense. I know that it doesn't. What do I do? I can't stay like this. Obviously, this made no sense. What was even weirder though was his tone. 
it wasn't devoid of emotion. In fact, it was quite the opposite. He sounded genuinely confused and afraid. Barely making any sound, Hathaway peeked past the corner, his vision aimed at the floor, presumably trying to avoid eye contact. However, as soon as he did this, he screamed and jumped backwards. I asked him what he'd seen, but he wouldn't turn to face me. A second later, I found out why. Fuck, I saw him. I saw his face. When I peered over, he was lying on the floor, just staring right at me. Fuck. I stumbled backwards, horrified at this sudden revelation. Just don't worry, he told me. I'll take care of Jake. And then I'll, I'll take care of myself. Just, just go find Colin and be more careful than I was, okay? Without needing further conviction, I turned and I ran the other way. As I did, I heard the sounds of a struggle and Hathaway screaming out in pain behind me. And there was also laughter for some reason. A hysterical, deranged laughter. And it sounded nothing like Jake. I ran across the corridors, making sure to only look to the wall so that I could just see in front of me from my peripherals. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard somebody call out from behind me. It was Beth this time. I'd nearly forgotten about her and all the panic. However, I wasn't about to take any risks. I raised the tranquilizer pistol towards her general direction. What's going on? She asked, sounding terrified. I responded curtly and directly. Have, have you looked in anybody's eyes since we left the lab? She let out a whimper. No. No, why? Oh, shit. Don't tell me. Yeah, it's out. I told her, still aiming the weapon at her. Oh, fuck. Well, I haven't made eye contact with Colin, alright? Now, I suppose that most people would have just let up in this situation. She obviously wasn't infected, right? But there was something wrong with what she had just said. Why did she mention Colin specifically? Why didn't she just say that she hadn't made eye contact with anybody? In addition to that, something about her tone was off. It was like a bad actor trying to deliver a line or something. I didn't know how to react, so I just froze there. And eventually, Beth started speaking again. Is... Is that a tranquilizer gun? Because that won't do anything. Before I could even react, she lunged at me. I closed my eyes as I felt her nails dig into my skin, and then into my face. She was trying to forcefully pry open my eyelids. Luckily, I had about 90 pounds on her, so I managed to throw her off of me. The whole time, she was assaulting me. She was letting out some kind of extremely deep, throaty chuckle as opposed to Jake's boisterous, hysterical one. Beth got up in an instant and lunged at me again. This time, I managed to put her into a chokehold. However, she... she wouldn't go unconscious. I must have held her there for about three minutes, but her relentless scratching eventually made it a task too difficult. I pushed her away and just started running. As I bolted out of there, I could hear her screaming after me, still letting out that disturbing chuckle. The weirdest part was that I could also hear her palms hitting the floor. Was, was she fucking crawling? I didn't try to find out though. I ducked into an adjacent lab and locked the door behind me. I heard her clawing at it from the outside, so I just laid down on the floor for a while in order to catch my breath. <sighs> Shit, she was still fucking laughing too. What the hell is going on? Wait a minute, I thought. The laughing was too loud. 
It sounded like it was coming from in the room. Hesitantly, I checked the door. And I nearly had a heart attack at what I saw. She was halfway through the damn door. But it was still closed. I could see her arms and face poking through the metal. Safe to say, I left immediately. Thankfully, there were two doors in the room, so I ran out into the adjacent hallway. I just wanted to get out of there at this point. I started running frantically, trying to search for an exit or a window or anything. At that point, I was disorientated. I couldn't place where I was in the building, but I still remembered to stay cautious, however. My heart nearly leapt out of my chest when I saw an illuminated exit sign. I followed it and was finally led to the door I entered through. However, Hathaway was blocking the entrance. He was hunched over, covering his eyes with his hands, and they were, they were dripping blood. You know, I, I just, I feel weird right now. Not like myself, you know. I heard him harder out. I tried thinking about it. Had it been three hours since our encounter with Jake? Surely it hadn't been. I guess he eventually heard me because he shifted himself towards my direction. Cam, is that... is that you? He spoke in a soft but somewhat threatening tone. I, I don't know what happened. I tried killing Jake, but he just wouldn't die. I think he's coming now. I feel weird, man. What's happening to me? Can you tell me, Cam? Right after he said that, a loud roar emanated from the corridor behind me. It was followed by what sounded like rapid crawling towards our direction. Don't worry about me, Cam. I always make it. Hathaway kept going. I always make it. I, I won't make it. He then fell to his knees, sobbing hysterically. I took that chance and bolted out of the front door, and as soon as I got out, I grabbed a bundle of nearby sticks and jammed the entrance. I'm pretty sure it won't last long, but it was it was the best that I could do. I got into my car and sped down the mountain trail, back onto the highway. I got home about 30 minutes ago, and I have no idea what to do. Should, should I call the police? Are they even going to listen to me? What about the FBI? Surely that's the best option here. I'll, I'll probably end up doing that soon, okay? That virus, or whatever the fuck that thing is, it cannot spread more than it already has. God, when I saw Beth's face coming through the metal door, I, I don't think I can ever forget that. And her eyes, they look something like straight out of hell. Her pupils were replaced by what looked like this deep purple vortex. It was all so fucked up. Wait. I... I made eye contact with her. Didn't I? Shit. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Bee Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family, and on social media too. Thanks again for listening guys, and I'll see you mates in the next one. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So, before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. Now, CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favourite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there, and I hope you guys check it out because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. (laughs) 
Something that happened 63 years ago that's haunted me my entire life. I've never told anyone about it until now. By Sergeant Darwin. It's official. I'm an old man. For the past couple of years, I've comforted myself by saying that I'm in my early 70s. But math is simple and unforgiving. Today is my 75th birthday, and boy, do the years fly. I'm not here for your well wishes. This is hardly a milestone that I'm excited about. I'm glad to still be here, of course, but I find that I have less and less to live for with every passing year. My bones, they ache. My kids live far away, and the other side of my bed has been empty for just over eight months now. In fact, once I cast my vote against Trump this November, I may have nothing to live for, at all. So, spare me your happy birthdays and your congratulations, if you please. I'm here because, well, I have a story for you. And it's one that I've never told before. I used to think that I kept it inside because it was silly. Or maybe because nobody would believe it. I've found, though, that the older you grow, the more exhausting it becomes to lie to yourself. If, if I'm being perfectly honest, I've never told anybody this story because, well, it scares me almost to death. But death seems friendlier than it used to. So, listen close. The year was 1950. The setting, a small town in Maine. I was a boy of nine, rather small for my age, with only one friend in the world to speak of. And his family, seemingly on a whim, decided to move 2,000 miles away. It was... It was shaping up to be the worst summer of my life. My pop was around, and my mum, she was a chore whore. <laughs> boy, was I proud of myself when I came up with that one. So, I wasn't apt to hang around the house. With some hesitation, I decided the public library was the place to be that summer. The library's collection of books, particularly children's books, was meagre to say the least. But within the walls of that miserly structure, I would find no undone chores, no nagging mother, God rest her soul. And perhaps, most importantly, no other children with whom I would be expected to associate. I was the only kid with a low enough social status to spend his precious days of freedom sulking amid the bookshelves. And that was just fine with me. The first half of my summer was even more dreadful than I had imagined it would be. I would sleep until 10, do my chores and then ride my bike to the library. And by bike... I mean rusty log of shit attached to a pair of wheels. Once there, I would split my time between unintentionally annoying the elderly patrons and deliberately doing so. One pleasant lady actually interrupted my incessant tongue, clicking to hiss a shut the fuck up at me. The first time that I ever heard a grown-up use the F word. A big fucking deal, I know, but in those days... It was unheard of. The dreary days turned to woeful weeks. I had actually begun praying for school to start again. Until I discovered the basement. I could have sworn that I'd roamed every inch of that library. But one day, in the far corner behind the foreign language collection, I stumbled across a small wooden door that I had never seen before. And that was where it all began. The door was windowless and made from oak that looked far older than the wall on which it was rested. It had a knob of black metal that quite literally looked ancient. I wouldn't have been surprised to learn that it was crafted in the 17th century, in fact. Engraved on the knob was what appeared to be a single footprint. I had the sense that whatever lay behind this door was forbidden to me, 
and therefore probably the most interesting thing that Ma would encounter all summer. Ma quickly glanced around to make sure nobody was watching me, and then turned the heavy knob, slipped behind the door and shut it. There was nothing, only darkness. I took a couple of steps and then stopped, unnerved by the totality of the shadow which surrounded me. I waved my hands in front of me in an attempt to find a wall or shelf or anything to hold on to. What I actually found was far more subtle, a small string dangling from above, but far more useful. I grabbed it firmly and pulled it down. Back in the day, lots of light bulbs were operated with strings, and this was one of them. My surroundings were instantly illuminated. I was standing on a small, dusty platform that looked as though it hadn't seen life in quite some time. To my left was a crickety-ass spiral staircase, made of wood and appearing ready to collapse at any second. The bulb was the only source of light in the room, and it was feeble to say the least. So, when I peered over the railing to see what lay below, the bottom of the staircase dissolved into the darkness. I was... I was beginning to feel scared. This place... Wherever I was, it seemed to have no business in a town library. It was as though I were in a completely different building. But no nine-year-old likes to let a mystery go unsolved. Looking back, I wish I could tell my prepubescent self to just turn around, go back, do anything else besides descend that staircase. You'll be spared of a lot of sleepless nights, I'd say. But, of course, I didn't know that then. And I may not have listened, even if I had. So, instead of turning back, I took a deep breath, gripping the rail and glared resolutely forward as I began my descent. The wood on the railing was dry and covered with splinters. I immediately let go, holding my hands out for balance as I carefully traversed the staircase. It was, or at least seemed, very long, and with only the dim glow from the string far above me, my heart pounded mercilessly in the darkness. Even kids can sense when something just isn't right. I think they just don't always give a shit as all. Well. By the time my feet reached the cement floor at the bottom, the light from the bulb above was very nearly a memory. But... There was a new light source. And God, I'll never forget it. Directly in front of me was a door, massive and a deep shade of red. The light was coming out from behind the door, and it shone out in thin lines from all four sides, a sinister, dimly glowing rectangle. For the second time, I took a deep breath and went through a door that... I shouldn't have. In contrast to the dank room that I entered from, the room behind the door was blinding. When my eyes adjusted, what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was a library, the most perfect library imaginable. I gaped in wonder as I stepped, almost reverently, further into the room. It was beautiful. It was smaller than the library above, much smaller, but it seemed to be almost tailor-made for me. The shelves were packed with brightly colored titles, and both armchairs in the middle of the room were exquisitely comfortable. And the smell, my god, the smell was simply unbelievable. Sort of a a mixture of citrus and pine. I... I simply can't do it justice with words. So, I'll suffice it to say that I've never smelled anything better. Not in my entire 75 years, in fact. But what was this room? Why had I never heard of it before? 
why was nobody else here? Those were the questions that I should have been asking. But I was intoxicated. As I gazed around at all the books and basked in the smell of paradise, I could only form one thought. I will never be bored again. In truth, boredom only hid from me for three years. It was on my twelfth birthday, 63 years ago to this day, that everything changed. Before that day, I visited my basement sanctuary as often as I could. Usually several times a week, in fact. I never saw another soul down there, yet strangely remained free of suspicion. I never removed a book from that room, but instead would pick up a particular volume wherever I had stopped reading during my previous visit. I sat, always in the same deep purple armchair, and always leaving its twin barren and directly across from myself. That armchair was mine. The other was, well, I suppose I couldn't have articulated it then much better than I can now. But it wasn't mine. That was for damn sure. On my twelfth birthday, I arrived later than usual. My mum had invited a couple of classmates and some cousins over to our house to celebrate, a gesture which I found more tedious than touching, really. I just wanted to spend my birthday sitting and reading and smelling paradise. Eventually, our guests went home and I made it to the library about 15 minutes before closing time. That didn't matter. The workers never checked down there before they locked up. I was free to stay as late as I wished. This particular night, I was devouring the final chapters of an epic adventure. Knights, swords, dragons, everything. I didn't smell it until I read the final words and closed the book though. The once exquisite aroma of that room had turned sour. I sat for a moment, unsettled. Objectively, I could recognize that the smell was actually the same as it had been before. That mixture of citrus and pine. I just perceived it differently. And I didn't like it anymore. It was the nasal version of an optic illusion. You know, the one that looks like a young woman glancing backward. But all of a sudden, you can see that it's really an old woman facing towards you. You can't unsee that, and I couldn't unsmell this. The spell was broken. The odour also seemed, for the first time, to be coming from somewhere specific. With a fair amount of trepidation, I stalked around the room, sniffing the air like a crazed canine until I came to a shelf near the back. The shelf was perfectly normal, with the exception of one title, a large leather-bound cover of solid faded maroon with one striking black footprint at the top of the spine. This, this right here was the source of the smell. I opened the front cover and saw one sentence scrawled neatly in blood red ink atop the first page. Rest your sorrows down, friend and leave them where they lie. I stared at this sentence, mesmerized as I began to retreat to my chair. I turned a page, and it was blank. But the smell became stronger. Another page, blank, and the smell grew stronger still. I stopped for a moment suppressing a gag and continued walking. Then, as I neared the armchairs, I turned one final page, and there, in the same sinister print, was the last thing I expected to see. It was... it was my own name. I dropped the book, and I just began to sprint toward the door, but as I shifted my gaze forward... My heart leapt to my throat and I stopped in my tracks. 
the empty chair. It... It wasn't empty anymore. An aged man in a suit sat before me. One leg crossed over the other, contemplating me with piercing grey eyes and a light smirk. This was all too much. I fell to my knees and expelled the contents of my stomach onto the carpet. I wiped my mouth, staring at my vomit, when I heard the man let out a chuckle. I stared at him, disbelievingly. Who are you? I asked, panic in my voice. The man leapt to his feet, grabbed me gently by the shoulders and helped me to my chair. He sat once again in his own. I fear that we got off to a bad start here, he said, glancing at the pile of sick on the carpet. The smell, it does take some getting used to. Who are you? I repeated. Tonight, you will know hardship like you've never before known, he said. I... I come as a friend, offering you refuge from it, and from all other storms which lie ahead. I wanted nothing more than to leave at that moment, but I remained seated. I asked him what he was talking about. Well, your mother is dead, my boy, by her own hand in her kitchen. The scene is gruesome, I must admit he said in sorrowful tones, but that there was a playful glint in his eye. Surely you wish to avoid this path. I can show you a safer one. My blood ran cold at the horrors this man spoke of, but I didn't believe him. What do you want with me? I demanded, trying to sound braver than I felt. He laughed an old, raspy yelp that seemed to shake him to his bones. <laughs> uh, nothing but your friendship, dear boy, he said. Then, sensing I found his answer inadequate, he expounded. I want you to come on a journey with me. My work is noble and you'll make a fine apprentice. And maybe, when I'm done, he sighed tiredly running his bony fingers through his thin white hair. Maybe then, my work can be yours. I stood up, shuffling toward the door, but never breaking his gaze. You're crazy, I told him. My mum isn't dead. She's not. See for yourself, if you must, he said, gesturing toward the door. I threw him a contemptuous glare and bolted for the exit. As my hand closed around the knob, he said my name softly. In spite of myself, I turned around. Your road won't be easy, friend. If it ever becomes too much for you, and I mean ever, he said, pausing to sweep his hand over the room. You know where to find me. I slammed the door behind me then took the decrepit stairs two at a time. I exited the library, clambered onto my bike and hightailed it straight home. But the front door was wide open. I dismounted, leaving my bike in a heap on the ground and approached the house cautiously. The old man was lying. He must have been. Still, tears began to sting my eyes. My heart pounding, I stepped inside and called out for my mother. I heard no answer, so I turned into the kitchen. To this day, I don't know why she did it. I've lived in that small town in Maine my entire life. Although, I've kept mostly clear of the public library. Well, once in my late 20s, I summoned the courage to step inside. Life was good at the time, and my fear had begun to morph into idle curiosity. Where the door to my basement sanctuary once stood was only a blank wall. 
I asked the librarian what had become of that basement, though in my heart I knew the answer. There was no basement, she said. There had never been a basement. In fact, if she had her facts correctly, city zoning ordinances prohibited a basement in that area. I've been haunted by that sickly sweet smell and that poisonous blend of citrus and pine ever since that long ago birthday. When I saw my mother in the kitchen that day, collapsed in a pool of her own blood, I... I smelt it. When a man, claiming to be my father, knocked to my college apartment door, begged me for money and beat me within an inch of my life when I refused, I smelt it then too. When my wife miscarried our second child, I smelt it. And again, when she miscarried our fourth. When our oldest son got behind the wheel of a family Buick, completely shit-faced and got his girlfriend killed, I smelt it. I began to smell it periodically as my wife became sick. She died late last year, and now I'm alone for the first time in more than half a century. And now I smell it every day, and it feels like an invitation. A few months ago, I went back to the library and the small oak door with the ancient handle it was there, right where it used to be. My evening walk has brought me past that library every day since, but I haven't gone inside. Maybe, maybe tonight I will. I'm, I'm frightened to die, yes, but lately I'm even more frightened to keep living. The old man was right. My road, it hasn't been easy, and I doubt that it's ever going to get any easier. Rest your sorrows down, friend, and leave them where they lie. He promised relief, a refuge, he said. Was he right about that too? Well, there's only one way to find out. After all, I still know where to find him. G'day mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the next story to thank you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. If you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favour, to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's b-i-s-h dot b-u-s-t-a at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and without further ado, here's the next story. The Worst Part About Delivering Pizzas is the Families by Dante Apar. Delivering pizzas, it's a shit job. Especially when you're a squirrely kid like me. I'm not exactly intimidating or threatening to anyone. Nor particularly nice, so I also got some pretty shit tips. But it's not the pay that's keeping me from going back. (laughs) I really wish that I could say it was, in fact. It started a few days ago, a normal day like any other. It was a Friday afternoon, a usually busy time, and that night was no exception. I recognized a few repeat customers' addresses in the order log. I offered to pick up a couple of runs, and the manager loaded up the bag and sent me on my way. I got to the first house after a few minutes. I always liked this family. The parents were nice, and... They had a cute daughter who would sometimes enter the door, which usually led me stammering through my words. I rung the doorbell and waited patiently. Finally, the door opened. 
I was surprised, though, to not see a face that I recognized. It was an older gentleman, and he had a jolly face and dark bags under his eyes, and a thin smile that parted his face, showing his yellow-stained teeth. Well, hello there, boy, he said to me, his breath striking my nose. Ah, uh, uh, hi, I nearly whispered. Ah, uh, 1764 is the total, I said while handing him the food. Part of me wanted to ask where the rest of the family was, but I didn't want to be intrusive. The old man reached into his pocket and pulled out an old wrinkly $20 bill and slowly extended his hand, his spindly fingers shaking as he passed me the money. Keep the change, my boy, his frail voice told me. Uh, thanks, I said, my skin crawling for some reason. I began to walk away when the old man got my attention. He reached his hand out and grasped my arm, his fingers icy and weak. I let out a small gasp of surprise and looked to the man in shock. He glared down at me, that slit of a smile never leaving his face. You're untouched, aren't you boy? The grey man said. What? I stammered. I... What? Don't play coy with me, boy. I know a virgin when I see one. The old man licked his thin lips while looking me up and down. I shoved him back, his weak body falling back into the house. And I bolted, leaving the door swinging wide open behind me. I nearly crashed my car, trying to leave the driveway and my heart slamming through my chest as I struggled to steer the car through the crowded streets. I couldn't believe what had just happened. My skin was covered in bumps, and a cold sweat was running down my back. My breath was shaking as well as my hands, and I was on autopilot. I drove straight back to the shop, a full bag of food still sitting next to me. I walked inside, my face. It must have been white. I tried to explain to my boss what happened, but he showed little sympathy and sent me back on my way after scolding me for a few seconds. I managed to calm down a little bit, the drive under the town lights soothing me. The next delivery was about a 20 minute drive and it gave me some time to decompress. The house was out of town a ways, on a country road surrounded by trees. I had never delivered there before, but I knew I didn't like it. I apprehensively walked to the front door. I knocked three times and held my breath on each occasion. To my relief, it was a young girl, maybe only three years older than me. She was really cute too and answered with a smile. I handed her the food with a dumb smile on my face and then stood there awkwardly for a moment. She gave me a strange look and I finally realized that she was waiting for. Oh, sorry, um, yeah, it's 12.89, I said as I looked down, fumbling through my bag looking for her receipt. Keep the change, my boy. I heard a voice say. I looked up to see the same old man. His hand, extending with a 20. The breath was stolen from my lungs as I stepped back in fear. The last family didn't work out, he said. I'll keep trying. One of them has got to have some fresh meat, right? I dropped the food and ran. My mind not being able to process anything that was happening... I drove so fast that I thought for sure I was going to lose control a few times. I returned to the shop with my eyes glued open, no money or food to give my boss. And needless to say, he was angry, threatening to fire me if this happened again. I, I pleaded with him, begging him to understand. He must have heard the seriousness in my voice because he began to ease up on me, explaining that I can stay in the shop for the rest of the night as long as I help clean at the end of the night. And I agreed, quickly. 
The agreement didn't last long, though. One of the drivers claimed that he was sick and left. Really, he just wanted to go and get drunk with his friends. The first order came in since the driver left, and the manager took the order down and showed me the log. My blood, it chilled. It was... It was my address. I desperately tried to explain to my boss why I couldn't do it. And he told me that I sounded insane. That I'm going to my own house and shouldn't have to worry about anything. He wasn't going to budge. I waited in the kitchen for 30 minutes, dreading every minute, when the manager told me that the food was ready and it was time to go. I took the food with trembling hands and got into my car. On the way over, I called my mum, and she answered nicely. Hey, are you delivering? My body rested in ease. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll see you soon, okay? That was about the gist of our conversation. My nerves calmed, knowing that she was home. I got there moments later, walking to the door with slight apprehension. I didn't bother knocking since, well, you know, it's my house and all. I walked inside, and my mother and my sister sitting in the living room watching a movie. They both said hi and my mother stood up to pay me. She fumbled through her purse quickly and scoffed. Uh, honey, go in the kitchen and, and get my money on the counter. I started into the kitchen, looking around for her money. My mother hollered something out to me that was muffled from the hall, and I shouted back, what? Uh, I forgot to tell you that your friend from work is here. Uh, he's using the bathroom. She shouted back. I gulped, my blood running cold again. I looked down the hall to the bathroom, my heart pounding in my ears as... I watched the knob turn. The door swung open into the hallway. The old man emerging from behind it. I dropped the bag I was holding, and my jaw dropping just as low. The man slowly closed the bathroom door behind him, and he looked at me with a wispy smile. Well, hello again there, my boy. I backed into the kitchen, no entrance to be found. And he walked down the hallway slowly, his yellow teeth jumping from his mouth. He closed in on me quickly and I tried to scream but I couldn't. His hands reached out towards my face, his icy fingers grabbing my cheeks. He pulled me in, his mouth open and lips wiggling. Just as his mouth reached mine, a fine black smoke burst from his lungs. It drained into me like soot to a chimney, my whole body feeling limp and lifeless. The, the uh, assault... It lasted only seconds, my body finally collapsing to the floor where his bony fingers released me. The man quickly left the room and only moments after that, I heard the front door close. I sat in the fetal position, my heart exploding and my eyes tearing. My mother found me minutes later, pleading to know what happened. I couldn't find the words to explain to her, and I simply stammered and murmured nonsense as I felt my insides burning. It's been three days now, and everything I eat, I puke back up. Same for drinking. I haven't been able to use the bathroom either. I've been getting massive migraines, and I fainted twice. My eyes are constantly bloodshot and my ears ring with no rest. My gums are turning a sickening dark maroon, and my breath is hideous. But that's nothing, though. I would take all of those things over what happened last night. I had just gotten done with a puking fit, and I was laying on the bathroom floor. The cold tiles felt nice on my back, as did my hand rubbing my upset stomach. I sat there for a weary half an hour, waiting for another feeling of nausea. In that silence and in that calm, 
I ran my hand along my belly and felt something that I never want to feel again. There was a kick. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family and on social media too. Thanks again for listening, guys, and I'll see you mates in the next one. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. So, before the episode begins, I would just like to say a huge thank you to CastBox for helping me make the CastBox original, Be Scared, which is produced along with Studio 71. Now, CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and you can find all of your favourite podcasts there. Personally, I think CastBox is the best podcasting platform out there, and I hope you guys check it out because I think you'll be surprised at just how much variety they have and how user-friendly their app is. Anyway guys, thanks for listening, and without further ado, let's begin. I Know Why We Never Return to the Moon by Delta 129. My grandfather was a combat pilot, and even though he always felt distant, I really liked him. When I grew older, I realized that he was always aware, always looking for any signs of danger. Shell shock, PTSD, it has many names. My mother told me that he didn't used to be like that, that he changed when he came back from Vietnam. My grandpa's profession was likely the reason why I was obsessed with space, astronauts, planes and pilots. We used to talk about it when we were together, and he was a really skilled and high-ranking officer in the army, and he knew some people, even a couple of really well-known astronauts. When I once asked him if he met anyone who went to the moon, he simply replied, Don't ever talk to me about the moon, boy. It's a dark and evil place. Unfortunately, he died back in 2004 from natural causes. About two months ago, we decided to renovate my grandparents' old house. While clearing out the attic, I found an old metallic box. In the box, there were a number of things which I assume belonged to my grandfather. There was a military medal, a stack of papers, and an old picture of my grandfather and two other men who I didn't recognize. My grandpa looked around 40, so I assume that the picture was taken in the 70s. All of them were wearing spacesuits, and the scene was a typical backdrop used by NASA. But... The logo was missing. There was only a blank monochrome background. The mission patch was titled Dawnbreaker. I didn't understand any of that. My grandfather was an astronaut? Why did he never tell anyone about this? Dawnbreaker? I've never heard of such a mission. It must have been covered up really well or something then. But why? I found the answers in the papers on the bottom of the box. I'll share the literal contents now, but I warn you that many people might find this very disturbing. So, it reads, My dear family, if you ever find this, I must confess something. In 1972, I was in Vietnam. I wasn't supposed to tell anyone, but if you found this, it probably doesn't matter anymore. Back in 1965, me and a handful of other pilots were selected for a non-public team of astronauts who would participate in covert missions in space for our government. We wouldn't get the glory and fame of regular astronauts, but our country needed us, and so we were there. 
in early 1972, we were told that for an unspecified period of time, our country had a secret satellite orbiting the moon. They never told us what it did or why it was there, just that a few weeks prior, it had crashed to the surface on the dark side of the moon for unknown reasons, and that the data it carried was pretty crucial. The government needed to recover it, and thus was sending me and two other astronauts to reclaim the satellite's memory module. The equipment of the planned Apollo 18 mission was essentially transferred to us. From what we've been told, the Apollo team was furious. They had a reason to be, after all. It seemed that whoever we'd been under was much more powerful than NASA even. The whole mission was top secret, obviously. I was officially deployed to Vietnam. Well, in reality, we underwent extensive training for the mission. After a couple of months, we found ourselves standing on the launch pad in front of this behemoth of a rocket that would take us to the moon. I was the mission commander, while Lieutenant Carver was the lunar excursion module, LEM, pilot, and uh, Lieutenant Ackerman was command service module, CSM pilot. Uh, the flight to the moon took roughly three days. After arriving, we made a couple of orbits around it. Each time we flew behind the horizon created by the moon itself, I felt a bit of helplessness when our communication to the whole world went dark, as the signal got obscured by the spherical mass of rock and dust below us. The dark side of the moon was nothing like the light side, which we see on an almost daily basis. Instead of smooth grey fields and tranquil lunar seas, it was completely covered in dark, deep craters and holes, like as if it was being slowly eaten away by the universe itself. It was finally decided to begin the descent to the surface. Me and Carver exchanged wishes of good luck with Ackerman, and in the lunar module named Sharon, we separated from the CSM named Trinity. After we announced Sharon has touched down, our response wasn't cheers and applause, but just mere... This is Trinity. Congratulations, Sharon. I'll relay the news on the other side. Be safe out there, pals. Just like that, we became cut off from the rest of the world. Ackerman was our only link. While he was above the light side, he could communicate with the ground command. And while above the dark side, he could communicate with us. But never both at once. Even though the CSM's orbital period was roughly two hours, we would be in touch for only about 35 minutes each orbit. We landed on a flat plane inside a huge crater. Contrary to what some people believe, the sun shines at the dark side of the moon the same way as the light side. The amount of light just depends on the lunar phase. It was still shining daylight in the place where we landed, but... We knew that it was going to get dark in a few days. I felt excited and curious about what awaits us in this alien world. We waited for about an hour and a half to get the command's reply from Ackerman, and spent the time by preparing our suits. Ah, uh, command sends their congratulations. You're to proceed with the recovery. Everything was dead silent as I stepped on the surface of the moon. I tried to think of something excessively inspiring to say, but those times were already over now. With Carver, we assembled the rover, and after planting our flag next to our spacecraft, we drove off. As we drove across the surface, I saw what I thought was a flash, like a glare reflected by something metallic in the far distance. Since it was fairly common to see flashes of light because of an interesting physical phenomenon caused by the space radiation interacting with our eyes, I didn't give it much thought and soon just forgot about it. After driving for a couple of hours, we reached the satellite. Or, at least, what was left of it. We immediately noticed that something... something wasn't right. There were dozens of footprints around the probe, leading to a set of two tracks dragging out into the distance. 
What the hell is this? Asked Carver in disbelief. Ah, uh, I don't know, but it seems that somebody got what we came for before us. I replied. And both the tracks and the footprints were different than ours. Whoever took the data wasn't here under the American flag. As I expected, we didn't find the data box. We found the part where it was supposed to be, but it was missing. Luckily for us, we were just in contact with Ackerman, so we reached out to him to describe our findings. This doesn't make any sense. Who would take it? Russians? They don't even have lunar programs. Even if somebody took it, how could we not be aware of that? How can the Russians land on the moon without us noticing? He responded. As far as we know, the Russians have no idea that we're here, you know? Said Carver over the radio. Well, we're going to follow the trail. I cut off their conversation. Uh, are you guys sure about this? Asked Ackerman. Hell, I'm not sure about it, but we're clearly missing something here. But I'll do as you say, Cap. Responded Carver. Yeah, if whatever was on that probe was so important for two countries to send people here to retrieve it, we have to find out what happened to it. I replied. Copy that, Sharon. I'll relay your whereabouts to command as soon as I can. Be careful out there. Our oxygen was at about half capacity now, but... We moved on with hopes of solving this mystery. It wasn't long until I saw something in the distance. As we got closer, I realized that it was a spacecraft. Its design was different than ours, and it was decorated with a flag of the Soviet Union. I couldn't explain why, but I felt that something was really odd about the spacecraft. If there really were Russians with us on the moon, they would have picked up on our comms long ago. So, there wasn't a point in hiding this, right? To the unidentified Soviet lander, this is the crew of Dawnbreaker. Please respond. We know you're here, we have you in sight. Nothing. We attempted to contact them several times again in both Russian and English, but always received only silence in response. We got closer and I realized why I found the spacecraft odd before. It looked like it had been there for a while. We couldn't see much of the interior through the small windows, which had been covered with something from the inside. Hey, uh, our air is running low and I don't like this, Miller. We should really head back now said Carver with clear uneasiness in his voice. Yeah, I know, but we have to find out what's going on here. It took some time until we figured out a way to open the airlock, and when we did, no one was home. The inside was a mess. The interior was splattered with brownish-red fluid, the presumably contents of one of the many open food packages lying on the floor. Or was it? No, I quickly pushed that thought out of my mind. It was a two-seater craft. There were a small amount of leftover supplies and samples, but no signs of the satellite's black box. There was a spacesuit hanging on the wall near the airlock. But two occupants and one spacesuit with a clear missing name tag? We both quickly realized that the other one must still be out there somewhere along with its occupant. At this point, we were really low on oxygen, so we rushed to get back to our spacecraft. As we reached Sharon with the last bits of oxygen in our suits, I... I realized something. Uh, tell me, Carver, was it just me or did we not pass the wreckage on our way back? I asked. Ah, uh, fuck. Don't even mention it. It wasn't there. That's right. We shared our intriguing discovery with Ackerman later, and he was as surprised as was command when we informed them in turn. 
That night, I took watch for the first four hours. It wasn't really a night, since the sun was still shining, but for the sake of timekeeping, we referred to the time when we slept as night. When it was finally my turn to sleep, I had a dream about following the flash that I saw the previous day. I walked on and on until I found the spacesuit from the Russian craft just lying there in the dust. The limbs were twisted and contorted in gruesome ways, but it was clear that someone or something was inside that suit. I approached and slowly began opening the sun shield that obscured the inside of the helmet. I looked in terror as I saw the inside. It was my face, covered with brownish-red blood, and in place of the eyes, there were only two gaping holes. The next day, we started picking up something on an unused channel of our radio. It was a faint signal from somewhere in the crater. We tried to patch it to the speakers, but it didn't make any sense. It was just repeating sounds resembling a person vocalizing the sound of a single letter or vowel, but stretched out to about three seconds, followed by an equally long pause. It was really distorted, and it clearly wasn't a loop, since each sound was just slightly different than the previous one. We ate and once again prepared for moonwalk. It was darker than the other day. The sun was still shining, but it was steadily creeping its way under the horizon. We followed the source of the signal for about an hour, when we found something lying in the dust in front of us. I tensed as I looked closer and found out what it was. It was a spacesuit. The same one as the one in the Russian lander. Well, looks like we found our missing friend said Carver with disbelief. I didn't say anything. I simply jumped on the rover and slowly, silently, approached the suit. What are you doing, Miller? Continued Carver. Just as I was about to open the sun shield with my shaking hands, the suit came alive and grabbed my hand. With the sound traveling through our suits, I heard a weak pomegit, meaning help in Russian. We carried him to our lander. The patch on his suit revealed his identity as Tarkov. He was in shock and hypoxic. I don't know how long or why he was laying there, but he was lucky to be alive. For the next couple of hours, he fell in and out of consciousness. He eventually woke up, though, and our Russian was bad. But luckily, he spoke English enough for us to understand each other. He didn't remember why he was there, what had happened to him and his crew or what his mission was. When I looked out the window, I realized that our flag was gone. There were no footprints and it looked as if it had simply vanished. At this point, each one of us was really concerned and we asked if we could terminate the mission. The command refused, explaining that the recovery of the satellite's data was of paramount importance. We decided to continue our search tomorrow, and decided to just get some sleep. G'day mates. So, I just wanted to take a quick break before the second half of the story to thank all of you guys for listening to Be Scared. If you're a new listener, welcome to The Hive. And if you're a long-time fan, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you could please take a moment to do me a favor to rate and review the show, that would be a huge help. And if you have any stories that you would like to submit for future episodes, you can send them to my email at bish.buster at gmail.com. That's b-i-s-h dot b-u-s-t-a at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and without further ado, here's the rest of the story. I again had the same nightmare as the day before. I woke up terrified and drenched in sweat. 
I saw Tarkov standing by the window and looking out. He then walked over to Carver and just stood there, looking at him while he slept for about a minute or two. Silently, I asked him, Tarkov, what are you doing? But he just mumbled something like them or when, and then just lied down. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, and I kept an eye on him, but nothing interesting happened. The next day, we found a picture or map of the crater that we were in pocketed in Tarkov's suit. There was a point a few miles from where we were that was marked with the cross. Tarkov didn't know why it was there, but I soon realized that it was right in the direction where I saw the flash on the first day. We, we had to go and check it out. Me and Carver later took off and headed towards this mysterious target, while Tarkov stayed in with Sharon. In reality, our rover had enough power to carry all three of us, but I insisted that it didn't, and that he should stay behind. Uh, I don't trust this guy, I said to Carver after I was sure that Tarkov was out of range of our short-range radio. We land on the moon and we don't find the box and suddenly the probe is gone. And then we find a supposed to be dead Russian who doesn't remember when was the last time that he took a shit. And now we're heading towards an inconspicuous place that was marked on his map that he knows nothing about. You bet I don't trust him. Hell, I don't trust a single step I take in that direction. He replied. What are we going to do about him? He asked later. Uh, I don't know yet, but uh, we can't take him with us. Neither the Lem or CSM is built for an extra passenger. You know that. I responded. Yeah, and I'm afraid that he knows that too. Replied Carver. The sun was setting and after driving for a while, we reached something that puzzles me to this day. Right there, in front of us, was something that I can only describe as a three-sided pyramid. It was about ten feet tall, and its surface was completely smooth and black as night. What in the world is this? Asked Carver, with a shiver in his voice. We walked around it and took some pictures. What the fuck? I suddenly heard through my radio. I turned around and saw Carver frozen in place, staring at something. There, in the remaining faint light, was a spacesuit about 20 feet away from us. I recognized the missing name patch and realized that it was the suit from the Russian spacecraft. But it was standing upright on its feet. And the sun shield was open to reveal a sight that terrifies me to this day. It was empty. The suit was empty. But it was standing upright. I came back to my senses after I heard crackling noises coming from my radio. You don't belong here. It spoke in a low, deep, distorted voice. Then, out of nowhere, I was blinded by an intense flash of light. When I recovered, the thing... It was gone. Carver, are you alright? I asked. He was silent at first, but then replied. Man, fuck NASA, fuck the army... Fuck the satellite and fuck this whole mission. I want to get out of here. Now. Without any debate, we ran to the rover and drove straight off back to Sharon. When we came back, the sun had already fallen below the horizon. And it was almost completely pitch dark now. The airlock was open and Tarkov was standing in front of the module in his suit. In the rush... We had completely forgotten about him. I approached him and started. Listen, Tarkov, there's something you... 
I stopped when I noticed that he was holding something behind his back. But it was too late. He swung and struck me with a sharpened rod. I hit my head on the side of my helmet and dazed fell to the ground. When the ringing in my ears stopped, I saw him and Carver fighting in the dust. I stood up and threw myself onto Tarkov, propelling us both a dozen feet. Before I was able to stand up again, he was already on top of me though. We struggled and just as he got a grip on the lever that was used to release my helmet, I struck his head with a sharp rock. His visor was cracked and while his air was slowly escaping his suit, I picked myself up and grabbed the rod. It was already stained with blood. He lunged at me one more time but I stabbed him in the chest. He then fell on top of me and when our helmets touched, he spoke as the last of his air was pulled out from his lungs. And he said, he is not your friend, follow the voice. I picked myself up and walked over to Carver. I saw that his suit was punctured on the thigh and brownish red blood was being sucked out into the airless vacuum all around us. When I brought him inside the Sharon, I realized that our first aid kit was gone. He was bleeding a lot, but I managed to slow it down. I had to treat him properly though, and I was afraid that if we took off, he would bleed out in zero gravity even faster. There was a med kit in the Russian thing, wasn't there? He said. Ah... Uh, yeah, I, th I think there was, actually. I replied. Miller, you have to go and get it. <sighs> Fuck. It's not that far from here, is it? Said Carver. Uh, no, it's not. But uh, are you sure you can hold out until I get back? I asked. Yeah, just, just go, okay? And so, I went. Don't die on me, Carver. That's an order, I said before leaving. As I said, it didn't take long until I reached the Russian lander, but it felt like ages. Throughout the whole journey, I waited for something to jump out of the darkness around me. I wasn't surprised when I saw that suit that was previously hanged on the wall was now missing. But still, I felt a shiver run down my spine. I took their med kit and headed back as soon as I could, but I couldn't stop thinking about Tarkov's last words. He is not your friend. Follow the voice. I just kept repeating this inside my head. I then switched the channel on my radio to the one where we heard the incomprehensible noise on, and it was still on. I realized that it was stronger in one particular direction, follow the voice I said to myself was this the voice that Tarkov meant who is not our friend Tarkov Carver the mission command back at earth I had to find out I drove off in the direction of the signal after driving for at least 15 minutes I reached a small crater about 30 feet in diameter with my headlight on, I immediately saw that something was inside, but I couldn't recognize it yet. I stepped over the edge and walked into the crater and switched my light to full intensity. I stood there, paralyzed with raw terror for what felt like hours. There was a rectangular block of the same material as the pyramid in the center of the crater, a body was lying on top of it. Its limbs were contorted in the most twisted and gruesome way possible. His eyes were missing, and in their place were only two gaping holes. It... It was Carver. There was a small box stuffed inside of his mouth. It was the black box from the satellite. I took the box and ran out of there as fast as I could. Carver was dead. And if Carver was dead, who was the Carver I left in the Sharon? 
he is not our friend was the only thing that I had on my mind the rest of the way back. When I returned, Tarkov's body was gone, but Carver was still there, lying, bleeding. But it wasn't Carver. What was that thing? Thank God you're back, Miller, said Carver. Not Carver. Carver was dead. Mutilated. Dead. Miller, are you alright? Continued, not Carver. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got the kit. I replied. He could know that I knew. Well, it couldn't know. I treated its wound, and the bleeding finally stopped. I strapped it in, and then strapped myself in. I didn't tell it that I found the black box. I didn't tell it that I found him. With the engine roaring below us, the Sharon split in half, and the crew compartment pushed us up into the void, while the legs stayed planted on the lunar dust eternally. Now, I had already wrote on several occasions that I had felt minutes pass as if they were hours. At the ascent and rendezvous, it took only a bit more than a dozen of minutes. But those minutes felt like decades. I wanted to scream so loud that my lungs would break, and I felt like I wanted to vomit. But I couldn't because it would find out. I wanted to black out, but I couldn't. I had to save Ackerman. After several lifetimes, we finally docked with Ackerman and the Trinity. Throughout the whole ordeal, we kept him updated. But meeting him was different. He was scared, but I was scared even more. He didn't know that Carver was not Carver. But... I did know. I unstrapped first and pushed Ackerman out of the docking tunnel. I kicked Carver, well not Carver, right in the face when he followed. And I closed the docking tunnel behind me. What the hell are you doing, Miller? What is wrong with you? Shouted Ackerman and slammed me to the wall of the command module. Don't open it, Mike. It's not Carver. That thing in Lem, it's not Carver. Do you understand me? I shouted back at him. Even though he was a battle-hardened soldier, Ackerman finally broke into tears. I floated past him over to the controls, and before I undocked the Sharon, I glanced at the docking tunnel window one last time. And there it was. A thing with Carver's face and body. But definitely not Carver, staring at us, but his eyes were completely smooth and black as night itself. He opened his mouth in a way that was simply not possible for a human, and let out a loud, disturbing screech that I wish that I could forget so much. In a heartbeat, it turned to dead silence as the Sharon detached from the CSM and drifted into the void. Me and Ackerman didn't say a single word throughout the three-day journey back to Earth. We were placed in quarantine for months after we came back home. Nobody ever explained to us what happened on that mission. I never did learn what was on that black box. And honestly... I didn't want to know, after everything I experienced up there. But whatever was there was apparently enough to cancel all other missions to the moon and beyond. They eventually released us and made it very clear that we were never supposed to talk about it. I, I never saw Ackerman from that day on. The only other time I talked about him was when a pair of men in suits came to my home one day, a couple of years after the mission. So, Captain Miller, have you been in touch with Lieutenant Ackerman lately? 
one of them asked after we exchanged our greetings. Ah, uh, no. I never spoke or heard from him since the mission. Did something happen? I replied. Well, I'm sorry I have to be the one to tell you, but uh, Lieutenant Ackerman was found dead in a nearby forest yesterday. I, I had to sit down. I didn't know him that well, but we spent a considerable amount of time together in training, and we lived through hell itself together, so it was more than enough for me to consider him a friend. Poor Mike. How did he die? I asked. Well, we don't know yet, but... He had a couple of fractures on all of his limbs, and mysteriously, his eyes were gouged out. And that's where the letter ends. I can't brush off the need to find out more about what happened to my grandfather and his colleagues. I hope that one day, soon if possible, I'll be able to find out more of this Dawnbreaker mission. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Be Scared Podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode too. Also, it would be much appreciated if you could share this new podcast with your friends and family and on social media too. Thanks again for listening guys, and I'll see you mates 